Hello, my name is Michael Tesoro, and I prepared this talk, ACCC Essentials, Understanding the ACCC's 2023-2024 Compliance and Enforcement Priorities. And I tend to do these summaries every year just to point out to business what they need to know about the ACCC's priorities, how the ACCC prioritises its competition and consumer law cases, what's on the hit list for the current year. So the reason I got that image too, I think the ACCC's performance has been pretty outstanding for a number of years now. So I think they probably can claim status to being the, the superhero of Australian regulators. Now a bit of background about myself. I'm a competition and consumer lawyer and I've been running my own practice to say legal consulting for the last 15 years and I help companies in competition and consumer law matters. Prior to that, I worked at the ACCC for 15 years in a variety of roles. Primarily in the end, at the end of my career uh, there at as a director in enforcement, but prior to that as a director in mergers, also in GST and the waterfront. Now on the presentation, I'll start with the background to the priorities, explain why the ACCC has priorities, then look at its approach to prioritisation. There's quite a sophisticated process, process that's undertaken. Then look at the 2023-2024 priorities, which I like describing as the hit list. Then look at the enduring priorities, discuss some other issues and finish with some commentary. Now the background to the priorities is that they're very important because businesses need to know that the ACCC will focus very closely on its priorities and look for cases in those areas. So if you're a business and you don't know what the priorities are, you're taking a big risk because you might be on the list and you can probably expect to be subject to scrutiny by the ACCC. So it's really important for business to review these priorities and learn from what they are saying, particularly about the types of matters which the ACCC will be pursuing. The process of formulating the priorities is quite sophisticated. What the ACCC do is they go out and they talk to stakeholders, including consumer groups, uh, people in the legal profession. I was recently contacted by the firm that assists the ACCC in this process and interviewed about what I thought about the priority. So they talked to practitioners and then once they've spoken to a, a large number of people, they develop the priorities and release them. And they've been traditionally released at the CEDA conference, which is in February, March each year. And that just occurred the other day and Gina Cascotlieb released the 2023-2024 priorities and in the past they released in February or March and they go for a, a year from that time which was sort of a bit of an awkward timing really for, for both the ACCC and for business but what was decided last year was to change the timing so that they aligned with the annual report for the ACCC and the financial year, which is a lot better because ACCC reports in its annual report to Parliament on how it's gone in meeting these priorities. So from now, they will run from July 2023 to the following June 2024. And as I said, the ACCC reports very closely about how it's gone in meeting these priorities. And I'll look at that a bit later on. And obviously the big recent changes, apart from the timing, is that these are the first priorities put out by the new chair of the ACCC, Gina Cascotley. Now, why does ACCC have priorities? Well, there's a pragmatic reason. They get so many contacts from consumers and businesses that there's just so many uh, numbers that they have to sort of process and deal with. And as you can see there, the number of contacts received in the 2021-2022 financial year was almost 400,000. And of those, almost 380,000 got entered onto the database. So a lot of those contacts are complaints. And as you can see, they further break down the numbers into scam complaints and non-scam complaints. So they're getting over 250,000 scam complaints a year. and over 100,000 non-scan complaints. So they've got so much coming in that they have to have some system for processing those, assessing and processing those numbers and identifying the important cases that need to be pursued. As you can see, the numbers have been rising quite steadily over the last five years. Now, this was a, a, a diagram which they obviously had in their previous annual report called the litigation funnel. And I think explain the process by which the ACCC 
work through all those complaints that they receive. And as you can see, they start with assessments of 254 complaints. Now, what that means is those 254 matters are allocated to a, an investigator who will do some initial work. So of all the complaints, they'll pick out 254 that often are within priority areas given to investigator and the investigator will do some research to search the database uh, see uh, if there are a lot of other complaints about the particular trader and so on once they've done that initial assessment it'll go to an initial investigation phase and that's the time when the investigator will draft a letter most likely to the company complained about or interview the complainant and get some further evidence. So at that stage is initial investigation, just to see if it's got merit to pursue further. The next phase, 68, go to in-depth investigation, and that's the stage at which the investigator will report to the commissioners, to the uh, people running the ACCC on the case, and seek their approval to continue the investigation at a more in-depth level. And that will often involve the investigator seeking a budget to pursue the case further. They may be seeking a budget to retain external lawyers to assist in the investigation. They may also be seeking approval to use statutory notices to issue 155 notices. So at that stage, the commissioners will say, yes, we want to pursue this case further and we'll approve a budget. So you see 68 cases get to that stage. You could also be spending money on an expert or even gearing up for litigation. And on those 68, ordinarily 15 cases would end up getting litigated. But that's not the way the ACCC deals with matters solely. They deal with matters in other ways as well. As you can see in the 2021-2022 financial year, they did meet their target there of 17 new competition and consumer law cases, but they also resolve cases formally by Section 87B undertaking. So they had seven of those that were enforcement related in that financial year. They had a few others in relation to mergers and, and other areas of their operations, but in relation to competition and consumer law matters, they had seven of those and also issued 19 infringement notices to 10 companies. So often companies will get two or three infringement notices for breaches of the law. And so as you can see, they had 43 formal outcomes in the last financial year. The thing that's interesting there is if you remember on the previous slide, they had 68 in-depth investigations. So as you can see, 43 of the 68 in-depth investigations resulted in a formal outcome. So that's a very high conversion rate for a regulator. It's obviously picking the right cases to pursue. And it also sends a very clear message to business that if you're at that initial investigation phase, there's a 60 to 65% chance that you will be either sued or be required to provide some formal resolution, whether that's an 87B undertaking or an infringement notice. In the last year, they took uh, 16 cases in the competition and consumer law area. And as you can see, there's uh, a few companies probably not super well known to, uh, to readers. For example, First Class Slate Roofing Small Business and RAD Roofing Specialists. But what you can see is a lot of very large companies. You've got Mercedes-Benz, Telstra, Optus, TPG, Booktopia, Meta, Honda, Uber, MasterCard and Airbnb. So they're taking on very large companies and that's obviously going to involve a big expenditure of resources to win those cases. And as you can see, they took Ultratune a contempt of court case for an earlier bit of uh, litigation, which results in some undertakings that weren't complied with. Now, as I said earlier, the ACCC reports in its annual report, which goes to Parliament on how it's performed against its targets and against its compliance priority. So as you can see here, the number of in-depth competition investigations completed, they were aiming to, to complete 30 in the year and they fell short. They only did 
uh, 20 and I think that's a testament probably to some of the size of the cases that they've taken they're big cases uh, which are obviously hard to uh, close in a short period of time the percentage of initial competition investigations completed within three months they had a target of 60 percent they were below that just slightly and the percentage of in-depth competition investigations completed within 12 months and that was much below their expectation so they had 70 percent expectation or target and they achieved 45 percent so this is suggesting probably an agency that's taking on hard cases potentially under resourced particularly these competition cases are very difficult to terminate and and come to a conclusion on quickly then in relation to the acl and industry codes performance you can see there that they had a, a better set of outcomes. The number of in-depth ACL and industry code investigations completed, they're aiming at 75, quite a bit below that at 56. And I think 75 might be a bit optimistic because industry code investigations from my own experience, like franchise code and so on, are, are very lengthy and, and involved usually. The percentage of in-depth ACL and industry code investigations that are in the priority areas was much above the target. They'd expected to get about 60% of their cases in those priority areas, well, they hit almost 80%. So that just shows how closely the ACCC will focus in on its compliance and enforcement priorities when selecting cases. Then you can see the percentage of initial ACL and industry code investigations completed within three months, so they've done better there, 70% percentage of in-depth in ACL and industry code investigation completed in 12 months, 64%. So that's quite low. But again, franchising cases do take a long time. And the number of actual outcomes in relation to ACL and industry codes, and that's talking about litigation undertakings and infringement notices. So there they met their target, which is 40 plus. They came in right at 40. So I guess it just shows how closely the ACCC report on their performance against their priorities. Now, how does ACCC approach prioritization? Well, it's looking at achieving three main goals. Firstly, to promote competition amongst businesses, but also promoting fair trading by businesses. So there is an element of protecting smaller businesses from bigger businesses who may be trading unfairly. And there's a big focus on pr protecting consumers in their dealings with businesses. So when they're looking at cases, they're obviously looking at detriment. There has to be detriment either to consumers, competition, or other businesses. So they also weigh up a range of other factors, whether conduct is significant public interest or concern. So if it's a private dispute, they're not interested, they'll leave that up to the parties to take their own private action. Also, there's a good prospect of maybe a class action being commenced. They will probably stay out of it. The conduct results in substantial consumer or small business detriment. So as you can see, detriment is really the key, but also they're looking very closely at the detriment to small businesses. Also, the conduct involves national conduct by large traders. And here they're noticing the obvious need to achieve general deterrence. So if large custom, large traders are doing things that are illegal, there's a chance that other market participants might copy their behavior, but also that conduct's going to cause a lot of detriment. Also conduct that involves significant Euro emerging market issues or where conduct's gonna have a educative or deterrent effect. So here clearly they're looking at new technologies and they've been very focused on in recent times, digital platforms. So I was looking at whether there's a new emerging market issue which needs to be regulated in some way at an early stage, I guess to prevent some detriment arising. And also where an action may assist in clarifying aspects of the law especially the newer provisions of the Act. So when a new provision gets introduced into the Act, invariably the ACCC will be looking for cases to take in those particular areas. Now, what's in the on the list for the 2023-2024 priority areas? I think it's fair to say that uh, the Gina Cass Gottlieb has pretty much decided to maintain the priorities from the previous year. There's really no significant changes in the list. 
the the order seems to have changed a bit but it's it's pretty well identical to the previous list and when she gave her speech she said that um, she wished to demonstrate some continuity in the ACCC's work program so quite unashamedly saying that we really want to continue working on the priorities which we announced for the previous year so as you can see the first one is environmental claims and sustainability and that's a very big priority not just for the ACCC but for other regulators such as ASIC and it's a global issue of importance regulators all around the world are focusing very much on that the ACCC has done quite a bit of work they had a, a a sweep of various sites and identified a lot of concerns and more recently they had a further investigation into some of the problems in environmental claims being made and it seems quite apparent that they're on the verge of taking some action against various companies they have a number of cases which are on on the go also scam detection disruption they seem to be very focused on that area in recent years with a lot of extra money going to it the talk of a or well, there's been some money dedicated to the establishment of a national anti-scam center ACCC has had a very significant role in that area for many years particularly seeking to disrupt scams which are often being run by organized crime groups consumer and fair training issues in relation to the digital economy and here there's a lot of discussion about the way that the digital economy uses manipulative and deceptive advertising and this is a lot of reference to dark patterns there's um, different choice architecture which digital platforms and other operators use when they design their interfaces with the consumers which seek to push consumers in directions which may not be in their best interest there's all different terminologies dark patterns uh, sludge etc and there seems to be a high prevalence of the use of these uh, types of processes in programs to try and direct consumers in in particular ways which are not in their best interest I think the best case recently is out of the US where Epic Games the designer of the Fortnite game was found to have engaged in the use of various dark patterns to make it harder for consumers to actually cancel a in in-store purchase and that was by removing the uh, undo button and hiding it more or less on the screen so people couldn't see it when they were playing the game so what resulted from that use of that particular dark pattern was a 25 percent decline in the number of cancellations of in in-app purchases so HBC is very focused on that unfair contract terms will be a very busy area towards the end of the year because the new changes to the laws are coming in in November and effectively it's going to be illegal from that time to use an unfair contract term the use of such a term could be subject to a maximum penalty of 50 million dollars 10 percent or three times the benefit or 30 percent of adjusted turnover they're huge penalties also the qualification thresholds are being raised so as a result a lot more companies are going to be caught by the legislation so for example currently a small business is subject to the legislation so it's 20 employees but it's going to be 100 employees from the end of the year furthermore the financial limit that exists currently is going to be totally removed so we're going to see a lot more companies being able to take advantage of the, the benefits of the unfair contract terms and also the ACCC being able to get very large penalties from companies that breach these laws also there's a big focus on essential services energy and telecommunications there's a lot of complaints in relation to telecommunications and I guess as we all know there's been a lot of problems in relation to energy supplies due to the war in the Ukraine as well as some major concerns about the competitiveness of Australian gas industry and towards the end of last year the government decided to bring in a price cap which the ACCC has a role in enforcing and in Jenny Cascot-Leaf's speech she did make it pretty 
clear that in the coming year she expects the ACCC to be doing a lot of work in ensuring there's compliance by energy companies with these, these price caps. So as you can see, obviously, essential services, energy and telecommunications and competition and pricing issues in gas markets, including compliance with the price cap. So that's going to be a big part of the business going forward. An issue that remains in the priority list is empowering consumers and improving industry compliance with consumer guarantees. And the two industries that have been focused on are motor vehicles and caravans. There's still a lot of problems in the motor vehicle industry with the culture of repairing vehicles rather than providing refunds. And uh, that is something that doesn't seem to be changing. So I think the ACCC is going to be taking further actions against motor vehicle companies such as uh, the one they took against Mazda, where it was found that the company would not give refunds to people for vehicles which were clearly suffering from a major failure. Then there was talk last year about an investigation into global and domestic supply chains. And this is a concern that potentially shipping companies and other global transport organizations may be colluding in the in the face of all the pressures arising from the war in the Ukraine and and uh, global energy shortages and this is a joint investigation involving a number of regulators including the ACCC nothing's really come out of this yet but I'd be assuming that there's some cases that they're looking at in considerable detail Digital platforms is obviously a very big area and what the ACCC has done is provided a outline of the, rem the remedies and the powers that they believe they need to curb the, the power of the digital platforms. And this has been provided to Parliament, uh, to the Treasury and the government. And what's occurring is that the Treasury has consulted with various groups about the proposed changes and they're considering those responses now. And we probably expect in the next few months the response from the government. And the main thing here is to create, I guess, uh, codes of conduct for different service areas. So it's a different approach to the approaches were, which have been taken overseas in, in Germany, in the UK and uh, in Europe. It's, it's very much looking at services for a uh, codes of conduct for specific service areas and then the designation of digital platforms in each of those areas. The promoting competition investigating allegations of anti-competitive conduct in financial services which, with a particular focus on payment services. So a couple of issues here that are interesting. I guess the first is the recently announced uh, inquiry by the ACCC into retail deposit markets and just looking at the way the banks set their interest rates for deposits and that was something that uh, Gina mentioned in her speech but also referred to the MasterCard case which is before the courts and that was a case where the ACCC alleged that MasterCard had entered into agreements with various retailers to prevent the Reserve Bank's lease cost routing initiative so it was a, an allegation of, a, of an attempt by MasterCard to subvert a reform that was supposed to increase competition in the market. The next one was exclusive agreement arrangements by firms with market power that impact competition, which you think potentially should be an enduring priority. But this appeared last year and then shortly after there was an announcement of the outcome in relation to Peter's ice cream where they were engaging in exclusive conduct. Um, preventing their competitors from getting access to distribution. So there'd probably be some further cases in this area. I think Gina alluded to the fact that they've got other cases they're looking at. Ensuring small businesses receive the protections of the relevant codes, agriculture and franchising. So obviously you've got the, um, the horticulture code and the dairy code. So clearly increasing enforcement in those areas and there's been a, a uptick in terms of enforcement of the dairy code in recent years. Franchising is all, always a difficult area to um, 
police, but obviously the recent settlement against RFG, which uh, took a fairly pragmatic approach to resolving the concerns and ensuring that consumers received or small business owners received some compensation, might, might signal a new approach by the ACCC to resolving those type of cases. And then consumer product safety issues for young children. And this is interesting one, because obviously the first thing that jumps to mind is the button back button battery code, which was a, a world's first and the HLC was very instrumental in getting that through. And it's, it's had a pretty big impact on a lot of businesses and also globally, but also looking at specific products in relation to uh, young, pe young children and making sure that they're safe. So I think we might see some further mandatory standards introduced in that area. Then you have the enduring priorities, and these are priorities which will remain high priorities going forward every year. And obviously cartel conduct is the first one on the list. And it's a very important uh, to recognize that the HLC has had quite a lot of success over the last year in relation to cartel conduct. The issues that, or the cases that were mentioned by Jenna in a speech involved the, the Vena money transfer case, admittedly very small businesses, but periods of um, imprisonment were ordered, but then the individuals were released on recognizance bonds. But then you had the Alkaloids Australia case where there was also a term imprisonment and it was served as an intensive corrections order uh, for a variety of factors or reasons. And then the two guilty pleas in relation to the waste price fix, which involved Bingo and Aussie Skips, where very senior, the most senior employees of both companies pleaded guilty, as well as the corporations. And there'll be a sentencing hearing occurring, I think, quite shortly in March, uh, April this year. So the ACCC has had a lot of success. Um, and uh, these cases weren't contested. That should be pointed out. Each case was a guilty plea. So the question still remains as to whether the HCC would be successful in running a contested cartel, criminal cartel case or the DPP. Any competitive conduct generally is uh, something that the HCC will focus on. And the important issue here probably is the, the New South Wales Ports case, which the HCC lost in first instance and then on appeal. And whether they'll seek to push that to the High Court may not be necessary because the agreement of most concern to the ACCC, which was a, an agreement which stopped the Port of Newcastle from setting up a container terminal, has been removed through an Act of Parliament. So whether there's any point in pursuing that case to the High Court is very questionable. Product safety remains a very high priority and the ACCC is not only doing a lot of enforcement in that area, but providing a lot of information uh, updating various uh, safety standards on a regular basis. So, and a lot of guidelines. So it's a it's, it's strong emphasis on both enforcement and education, focusing very much on consumers who are vulnerable or disadvantaged. And uh, that's been a priority for a long time. And there've been some very important cases there in, in various sectors like aged care. And uh, also in relation to the VET providers where there was a lot of uh, unconscious conduct towards people of low socioeconomic backgrounds. And then obviously the area where the ACCC has been very active for many, many years now is in relation to Indigenous Australians, where there's a lot of outrageous behaviour with people trying to take advantage of Indigenous Australians in remote communities. I think the, the low light of that particular uh, enforcement area has been Telstra's uh, exploitation of a lot of Indigenous Australians and resulted in a $50 million fine. So the ACCC is obviously going to continue not just enforcement activities in that area, but also providing some very good resources for Indigenous Australians so they know what their rights are. So that's uh, a summary of what's on the hit list for the 2023-2024 period. And I guess um, I think there's a couple areas where the ACCC may want to look at including as priority areas in future years. And I think one area is misleading animal welfare claims. HPC did quite a lot of work in this area a few years ago, particularly with uh, caged chickens and um, other um, 
ducks and other animals like that. But I think there's quite a lot of animal welfare claims being made, and I think it'd be a good addition to the priority areas. Another area that I'm surprised wasn't in the current priorities is having a look at anti-competitive labour market agreements, because there's a very big focus overseas, not just in the US, but in, in Canada and Europe. And there seem to be a lot of no poach type agreements, which um, prevents employees from being able to change jobs easily, uh, that do restrict the flow of, of labour. So I thought that might be something that ACCC would be including in this set of priorities, but uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't in there. So that might be two areas where I guess next year the ACCC might want to look at them. So I guess the main thing about uh, the compliance uh, and enforcement priorities is that the best way to avoid them, avoid a problem with ACCC is to have a compliance program to make sure you set one up. And even your small business, you probably should do something like this. The first thing to do is do a risk assessment, see where you do actually have legal risks. Then you can appoint somebody in the business, a compliance officer. They're going to have responsibility for ensuring that compliance is, is a day-to-day -day issue of conversation in the business. A compliance policy which sets out the expectations of all staff in terms of complying with the law, reporting things to the compliance officer that may be problematic. A few extra policies would be good, like complaints handling policy and a whistleblower policy at the bare minimum. Really, you've got to have a good policy in place to handle your complaints because that's the main source of information that will show you've got a problem in the business. And also whistleblower, you really want people to have enough confidence to let you know if there's a problem in the business. Also, you need to be able to deal with your complaints effectively. Uh, if you've got a lot of complaints, that's a problem. Uh, but if you don't have a system for dealing with a lot of complaints, that's a bigger problem. So you need to have some process whereby you record all your complaints, but then you periodically review them to see what they're telling you. You've got to be able to identify systemic problems. And then the final issue is regular competition and consumer training. You've got to be telling your staff at least once a year what the law is, reinforcing important messages, and then ensuring that they are aware of any important legal changes that might impact their work. So that's all I had about the compliance and enforcement priorities for 2023-2024. I think probably the main takeaways is that Environmental and sustainability claims are going to be a very big focus. And I, I should have mentioned earlier that they've ACCC set up a specific internal task force, which is going to, which is just going to focus on that issue. So I think we can expect a lot of investigations and litigation in that in that area in the coming year. I think there's also um, an important thing to note is that. The ACCC is getting pretty tired of the fact that companies are just breaching their consumer guarantee obligations and it's it's made a play to government to have it made illegal to breach a consumer guarantee obligations. And so they've tried that before and haven't had much success, but we, I understand that they're going to government again and trying to get that change through. And I, I fully expect it's going to come in. I think the Labor, Labor government will be quite responsive to a change which makes a breach of consumer law illegal. And uh, I think the other issue that's really important to focus on is the unfair contract term laws, which are going to change at the end of the year and become much more serious. And one thing that Gina Cascotley mentioned in a speech is that they're currently in the process, the ACCC currently in the process of undertaking a review of business terms and conditions across a number of sectors. So they're obviously looking at uh, companies' uh, terms and conditions. It's a proactive review. And uh, they'll probably have a, a list of uh, hit list of companies to to write to as soon as those changes come in in November. So companies need to be very focused on their terms and conditions um, going forward. So that's all I had. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to give me a call or drop me uh, an email. Bye bye.